As we walk up a gentle hill, a domed mound emerges from the earth like a small, gently sloping mountain. On its peak sits a strange device that looks like a tiered parasol. Four ornately carved gateways mark off and control the access to this monument. The monument cleverly juxtaposes these ornate gateways with plenty of scenes and figures against the backdrop of the massive dome that looks like the upper part of a smooth stone egg. This doesn't look like anything we've seen before. What is it? This is the great stupa at Sanchi, the most ancient stone structure in India. It was built to contain the relics of the Buddha by the great emperor Ashoka, in the 3rd century BC. It was remodeled and added to for centuries after, until about the 5th century AD. It was forgotten and overgrown until the 19th century, when it was noticed again. Unfortunately, it was ravaged by treasure hunters until its restoration in the early years of the 20th century. The stupa is the main focus of a whole complex of Buddhist structures on a hill at the village of Sanchi. It's located in the central part of the Indian state of Madhya Pradesh. The stupa rises to 54 feet high, and it's 120 feet across. Near it are lesser, smaller stupas built for the Buddha's disciples. So, what is a stupa? Essentially, as you see, it's a domed mound which resembles an earth tumulus. Those are funerary mounds which existed in early India, Greece, and elsewhere. But this mound not only resembles a stone mountain, it is a Buddhist place of worship, so it has symbolism beyond the funerary. At its core is a relic of the Buddha, some of his ashes, which are thought to have living energy because they contain his spiritual essence. When the Buddha died at the age of 80, he was cremated, and his ashes were divided into eight portions as he desired. These ashes were then distributed to eight rulers who built stupas over them. Only Sanchi survives, so in this very basic respect, Sanchi is a funerary monument. And many of the stone or dirt artificial mountains that we are looking at have these multiple meanings. They start out as funerary monuments, like the Egyptian pyramids, with their funeral cults to the deified dead ruler. Buddhists, however, believed in rebirth, or a chain of rebirths. So this stupa has more overt symbolism that is cosmic in nature rather than purely funerary. The stupa structure puts forth tenets of Buddhism and illustrates the Buddhist conception of the world. It represents both the universe and the Dharma, the path according to the laws of the Buddha. Buddhist pilgrims came to this and other stupas over hundreds of years primarily in order to venerate the Buddha. The aspects besides veneration associated with the spot are these. So, one, the mound built over the ashes represents a sort of cosmic mountain which celebrates nirvana, the final state of Buddhist enlightenment. Two, the stupa, in its various parts and purposes, actually represents the totality of the Buddhist world. In the most basic terms, its high base represents the earth, its body, the dome, the sky, or cosmic egg, and its center, the axis mundi, or world tree. Thirdly, the railing around the parasol-shaped structure, the harmika, 
protects the parasol, which in different interpretations stands for the Bodhi tree or the supreme rule of Buddha. The symbolism of the parts of the stupa is complex and interesting with many layers of meaning. Learning and understanding the complexity of Buddhist symbolism serve to initiate one and tie the community of Buddhists together. Let's look at how this stupa at Sanchi is composed so we can understand it better. You are walking in what was an isolated setting, a sandstone ridge near the confluence of two rivers. Groups of saffron-robed Buddhist monks and nuns move with you as pilgrims. As you approach the stupa, you walk upwards and see the gentle mound rise before you. It is a hemisphere created with layers of masonry. At its top is this peculiar square railing, the harmika, at the center of which sits the three-tiered parasol-like element. But before you can reach the mound itself, there are barriers. A balustrade of stone surrounds the structure. That stone fence protects and separates the sacred space. In a sense, you are made aware by the enclosure that you are no longer in the everyday world, but have entered this sanctified space. The stupa and the world that you've entered is a perfect, protected, and utopian space. Fortunately, there are gateways to enter it, and passing through the gates signifies the transition from the profane world to the sacred space. These elaborate gates, called torana, are placed at the four cardinal points of the compass. They were built later than the stupa, in the first century AD. These torana each consist of two square pillars, connected by three gently arching architraves or parallel beams. The gateways are completely covered with superb relief sculpture showing scenes from the Buddha's life. Exuberantly carved figures like the yakshi, or female tree spirits, support the architraves. We'll look closely at these sculptures in a moment. Once you enter the sacred precinct, that space which runs around the outside, you can then climb one of the double flights of stairs up to the plinth and the processional pathway. This may remind you of the double stairs we saw at Persepolis and also at the Ziggurat of Ur. They're more formal and ceremonial than a single stairway. Once you're up on that level, you can walk in a circle around the stupa, which is what the pilgrims did. They circumambulated the mound in a clockwise direction. Circumambulation is a kind of ritual which we see in many places. It is common at Buddhist and Hindu shrines, and we will see it at Borobudur in Java. It is the rite performed around the Kaaba in Mecca, the most sacred act in Islam and the climax of the Hajj or pilgrimage there. In effect, the pious making a pilgrimage to Buddha stupa here ended their journey similarly with a circling round the holy place. But there are other kinds of pilgrimages in controlled pathways that occur in a lot of other places. I'm thinking of ancient Andean sites like Chavin de Huantar or the Nazca Lines, which were walked in religious rites by pilgrims. The pilgrims walked along the lines, which were in a variety of shapes, including the animals. Walking in a procession is a basic rite we see in most religions and it gets the participant to be physically involved and invested in the rite and the religion. Participation with others also strengthens the bonds of the religious community as well. We already saw something similar happening in the processional ways of Babylon and at the Acropolis and the Parthenon. The art or architecture that encourages these rites is an important part of the religious indoctrination. These kinds of processions, and particularly circumambulations, may have their roots in the ritual marking of boundaries. 
On the most basic level, these rights have been linked to our instinct for territoriality by scholars of religion such as Walter Burkert. We saw an element of circumambulation in Rome with Trajan's column. Incidentally, I thought of this while reading and watching the film of E.M. Forster's Howard's End, in which the lady of the house circumambulates her house at dusk. Circumambulation may even, in some cases, represent the passage of the sun on its route through the heavens. I also believe that this kind of circumambulation stimulated a soothing response in the pilgrim, perhaps inducing a trance-like state suitable to a religious experience. But let's go back to the stupa and its story. The stupa at Sanchi wasn't all built at once. It had various stages, which coincided with developments in Indian religion and society. The first version of the stupa was built by the emperor Ashoka the Great in the 3rd century BC, and it consisted of a much smaller brick mound which contained the ashes of Buddha. Ashoka was a great ruler of the Mauryan dynasty from 272 to 235 BC, and the Mauryan Empire was geographically one of the largest at its time. Ashoka embraced Buddhism after a bloody war. He renounced violence. He even gave up hunting and became a protector of animals in his famous edicts. In fact, one inscription on a pillar says, he did not kill many animals. One of Ashoka's wives came from Vidisha, a commercial city near Sanchi, which is probably why the stupa was located here. The stupa was subsequently enlarged to double its initial size during the reign of another king of the succeeding Sunga dynasty. The original brick core that Ashoka had built was covered with sandstone masonry. This was whitewashed and the railings were colored in a red tint to contrast with each other. The stupa was also probably painted with swags. So you could say the original stupa was enclosed and it was layered upon like an onion. The stupa is not penetrable. It's a solid mass like a sculpture and less like architecture, which after all has internal spaces. There were no taranas or ceremonial gateways yet at the stupa at that early stage. They were added about 100 years later, about maybe 50 to 25 BC and possibly after. In an interesting twist, these artworks, the reliefs on the taranas, were apparently carved by ivory carvers and paid for by donations from surrounding folk. Those ivory carvers put their skill for miniaturist detail and clarity into good use here. The donations by the local people to the stupa and its associated monastery were encouraged by Buddhist practice. These donors could be merchants, holy people, or other pilgrims who would pay to have scenes from the life of Buddha carved into the gate reliefs. The Buddha was not actually shown in an image at this early phase, so his presence was indicated in the scenes by footprints, trees, or other symbols. The interesting thing is that here at Sanchi, you have a totally abstract cosmic symbol, the dome, which constituted the stupa, juxtaposed with four gateways that are a riot of designs and narrative art. The Taranas are full of figures, animals, landscapes, and allusions to the life and doctrines of Buddha. They tell actual stories from the life of Buddha and show scenes of contemporary life in a detailed, realistic, and practical style. They're even informative, pious, and you could describe them as almost chatty. The narrative sequences are framed by decorative elements taken from nature like flowers and trees. The reliefs have great ornamental charm, especially the flora and fauna, like the elephants on the columns. The yakshi, or female tree spirits, are enchanting, and the one depicted on the East Tarana is truly exquisite. 
So not only do we admire the artistic excellence of the reliefs, we can learn a lot about what life was like in northern India in an important era, during and after the time of the Emperor Ashoka, from about 200 BC to 200 AD. In effect, these gateways have more in common in terms of style and content with the Column of Trajan than they do with the stupa to which they belong. They even share the shallow perspective for showing people and landscape. To engage in another analogy, the stupa is more comparable to the ziggurat of Ur and the gateway is more like Trajan's narrative and the Parthenon frieze. You have a solid sculptural mass contrasted with narrative relief. In addition, the gateways at Sanchi are penetrable by people, but of course the stupa is not. One aspect of Indian art that becomes apparent in these tarana is this. The Indian aesthetic allowed for no vacuum in space. They had full tilt horror vacui. You see this in a great many temples in India. The ornament runs riot. It's a stylistic choice, emblematic of the culture, which shows a preference for and constant engagement with people and stimuli, rather unlike the contemplative isolation that you might find in New England landscapes in the U.S. Now let's take a look at the gates more closely. Here's the south gate. Each of these gates was modeled upon wooden forerunners, so the stonecutters still carved it a bit, perhaps, as if it were wood. The architrave's triple beams are lightened both by their curvature and the space between them, which is punctuated by vertical struts. All are decorated in relief. The beams form a perfect space, a register, upon which a narrative can unfold. The south gate was the first to be built and was the primary entrance. So the south gate begins the narrative with an account of Buddha's birth and scenes from Ashoka's life. The square pillars supporting these gates are worthy of some close scrutiny because some are the finest examples of decorative patterning in Indian art. Each face of each column has a separate, different pattern, and some of these are plant-based, running riot with flowers, vines, and the abundance of life that grows from the earth and waters. This one is a masterpiece of lush plants and vines in profusion. It's melded with five pairs of symmetrical animals with humans mounted upon them. The formal qualities of symmetry and upward spiraling movement of vines perfectly encapsulate some of the basic concerns of humanity, natural abundance and life in its most perfect order and form. The vines and plants actually appear to be growing. These form the basis for life and are suited to upholding the beams. One of the most pleasing designs is found on the east gate which illustrates an exquisite undulating vine with lotuses interspersed with ducks. It is luscious. At the top of each of these pillars, we find its capital, consisting of a set of four lions or elephants or pot-bellied dwarves. These charming capitals support the architrave. They may have been influenced by column designs from Persia. Remember Persepolis? Like the Persepolis columns, they are still supports for the beams above. The southern gateway's pillars are topped by a four-lion capital. This is important because these lions on a pillar are a symbol of King Ashoka, who built the stupa. In fact, the symbol of Ashoka is now used for India itself, appearing on its currency. Lions, of course, are powerful symbols of royalty, and the famous column of Ashoka is one of the other foremost ancient monuments of India. On the outside of the capitals, supporting the beam's extensions, can be found these beautiful and fertile full-figured salabanjika, or yakshis. 
There were six, perhaps at each gate, on each level, but many have been lost, as has the wheel of Dharma that sat at the very top of the gates. Yakshis are well known and frequent in Indian art, and if you compare the figure of this one with our Babylonian queen of the night, you can see that the reference to fecundity, sweetness, and abundance as embodied in the young woman's figure couldn't be made any clearer. The yakshi is a spirit of nature, and she has the natural grace of a dancer as she poses elegantly in the tree branches. The tree itself is an important symbol of nature, and it can be seen as an outgrowth of the scene below, the column's unfolding vines. The spirals at the end of the beams have been interpreted as the continuation of the vines, although other symbolic meanings have been posited. The vines, the yakshis, and the plant motifs are sort of border or frame for the narrative stories in relief, and they've been interpreted as a tree of life and the vine known as the wish-fulfilling vine. These kinds of images of fertility of nature combining plant and female fertility, as you've seen, are almost universal. We can recall the symbolic rosette of Ishtar as a plant representing fecundity. The images here at Sanchi visually invoke the procreative powers of a young woman, particularly when she's shown with this kind of exaggeratedly fertile curves. Our yakshi is naked, except for a decorative belt, which encircles her hips, and she is jeweled, just like Inanna Ishtar was. These jewels, contrasted with her nudity, only make her more precious and desirable. The north gate is intended as the main gate. As you can see here, it has elephant capitals, and elephants appear as struts between the lowest beams and on the relief at the top as well. Elephants, being the largest land mammal and native to India, were both useful in war and symbolic. The Buddha himself was said to be the result of the white elephant appearing in his mother's dream. The Buddha's birth is depicted here. Another interesting scene depicts the Buddha's leaving of this world. His stupa is garlanded with flowers, a balustrade like the real one at Sanchi is represented, and worshippers cling to or kneel at the stupa. The stupa looks just like Sanchi, and columns on either side recall that such columns also existed at Sanchi. Another fascinating detail on the gateway shows what an early urban center in India might have been like. Here, you can see a city gateway. It is part of the fortifications of the city, and you can also see the high, small windows in the fortifications. The crenellations, these indented battlements, and barrel vaults are even shown. Lots of spectators above and behind the railings are watching the procession with an elephant. Other scenes on the North Gateway illustrate the jatakas, or stories, like fables, that would reinforce Buddhist doctrine and values. The East Gateway has scenes showing the Buddha in the jungle, being worshipped by animals. He's represented by a tree, as this shows him after his enlightenment. Animals shown here, as you can see, include lions, water buffalo, griffin-like creatures, a multi-headed naga, or cobra, and two human-headed sheep. A horned gazelle appears to be scratching its face with its back leg. On the arch below, elephants worship at the departed Buddha stupa and bring garlands to it. A variety of animals are depicted at Sanchi, including these camels, large parrots, and many, many more. One of the most famous scenes on the front of the gateway shows the Bodhi tree, a symbol of enlightenment, surrounded by a pavilion and a balustrade rather like the real one at Sanchi. Another scene on the north pillar shows the Buddha returning to Kapilavastu. It's a royal procession, 
with a chariot with two horses. They are shown in something rather similar to the Roman perspective used on Trajan's column. Behind the moving procession, you can see two multi-storied buildings. They have wooden balconies at the top, out of which people peer at the procession. We see here in the East Gate the dream that the Buddha's mother had when she was foretold of his birth. You can see her sleeping as the white elephant nudges his way into her. Supposedly, he tapped her on the belly with a lotus blossom, and she became pregnant. Another fascinating scene here is the miracle of the Buddha vanquishing a many-headed serpent appearing in the fire temple. This act helped convert the Kashyapas, who are shown with dreadlocked, matted hair. You can see that the buffalo below raise their heads at opposing angles, framing the central miracle. The Southern Gateway's interior middle arch illustrates a scene from the Jatakas. Jatakas are tales like fables from the Buddha's past lives that are meant to illustrate virtues or faults and thus to encourage good behavior. This one is the tale of the six-tusked elephant king who has a jealous wife. She is reborn as a princess and has him killed for his tusks, but she's then stricken with grief and remorse when she sees them and dies. Another scene illustrates the mother of the Buddha, Maya, being bathed by elephants. This symbolizes his birth. Riders on horseback are depicted in different places on the Tirana, sometimes in adorced or back-to-back -back positions, which achieves symmetricality of the animals, much like we saw with the lions upon which the Babylonian Queen of the Night stands. The Western Gateway's arches have some other informative scenes from the life and teachings of the Buddha. Here's one we haven't seen yet. It shows the Buddha portrayed as a wheel. The wheel is the wheel of Dharma, and it has been set in motion. That is interpreted to mean that the Buddha has become a teacher. He has been preaching and taking disciples in order to spread his teachings of the Four Noble Truths. This could be an image specifically of his first sermon at Deer Park in Sarnath. You can see the deer at either side, and this is where he preached the Four Noble Truths. One, life means suffering. Two, the origin of suffering is attachment. Three, the cessation of suffering is attainable. Four, the path to cessation of suffering is the Eightfold Path. A pillar scene here illustrates a Jataka. This one shows the story of a king who mistakenly shoots and kills a man drawing water on the banks of a river. Turns out the man is the only caretaker for his blind parents. The king realizes what he has done and he repents by serving the parents in the son's stead. The king of the gods is moved to bring the son back to life and restore the sight of the parents. You can see the king depicted in four positions here, marking four sections of the story. The shooting, the realization, the penitence, and the happy ending. The western gateway's interior view shows the war of the relics, battles that almost happen over the disposition of the ashes of the Buddha. Different kings claim them, and you can see the massing of the armies here, including war elephants and chariots. All these didactic stories, the Jataka, the story of Buddhas renouncing worldly things and achieving enlightenment, serve an important purpose. The pilgrims who came to this monument had, on the one hand, a pleasurable sensory experience of walking in a procession and circumambulating the stupa, of praying and contemplating the huge mass as an abstraction of both the Buddha and the cosmos. But on the other hand, when they walked through the gates, 
they would have had a visual and intellectual experience as well. They would see these narratives and understand them as the biography of the Buddha. They were being encouraged to emulate Buddha's life and good deeds. If they did follow in Buddha's path, they would also feel happiness and pleasure in their accomplishments and their lives. In a sense, the reliefs were a form of indoctrination, not in the negative sense, a reminder to follow the path set before them by the Buddha. Finally, the reliefs also provide a history of the religion. This type of art, which tells the biographies of gods and holy people and the stories associated with the religion, exists elsewhere, of course. We saw it at the Parthenon in the pediments with their record of the birth of Athena. And we see it in all the paintings, altarpieces, and Gothic cathedrals that record the story of Christianity. The Stations of the Cross in a Catholic Church require this sort of movement and prayers as well. When we next sit down on the island of Java in Indonesia, we shall see the biggest and most elaborate stupa of all, Borobudur. Though quite different in many respects from Sanchi, Borobudur nevertheless has the same cosmic vision. It's even more elaborately carved, and it represents the culmination of Buddhist monumental architecture and sculpture.